you everyone for tuning in to yet another episode in which I talk about issues related to public transport. Um, now, as I, as I said on social media, our topic today is interface between commuter rail or modernized commuter rail and buses, although this these can also be trolley buses or something in cities where the kind of main very local mode of transport is the trolley bus, like duty or something. Um, and this is, so I'm pretty sure that I've already talked a bunch about timed connections and uh, outlying areas. I think, I don't remember which example I have. I'm pretty sure it, was, it would have been Framingham or Worcester, where you can timetable the commuter trains to come every half hour. Um, and then in city center, trains in both directions come roughly on the half hour, every half hour, and then the buses are all going to converge there um, in, a, in, a, in a pulse every half hour. And this is not so I'm not trying to talk about that. I'm going to talk about more central city stuff. And when I say central city, I don't mean something like Worcester being originally more urban than it is today. I mean New York, I mean LA, I mean things like that. Um, I might do a European diversion later, I'm not sure. So what I mean by this is that um, in central cities, but not in their central most area. So we're talking about New York, but we're not going to talk about Manhattan very much, except maybe upper Manhattan, even that, not really. Um, buses are generally a tool for connecting where the subway doesn't go. Um, so, um, very little of New York City bus ridership is parallel to the subway. It's not zero or anything like that. Uh, for example, the corridor on First and Second Avenue is kind of strong. It used to be the single highest ridership bus in New York City. I think it no longer is because Second Avenue subway opened, but I'm not sure in any, at any rate, Second Avenue subway is only a quarter open, so part of it is just feeding the train. Um, I think it sells number two or something. Um, I think at this point, number one is Fordham. So it's this corridor, which goes where the subway doesn't go. The subway in the Bronx goes north-south, goes to Manhattan, this is east-west. This connects all the various subway lines. Um, and, um, uh, or if you want more radial corridors, again, there are some pretty strong ones in Manhattan. Again, first and second is still a thing. Um, the various buses in Airline and Third and Lux or Fifth and Madison. But for the most part, it's things that are, again, where the subway is not. So it's stuff like Nostrand and Utica. These are the I think top two bus corridors in Brooklyn. Um, Nostrand, to some extent, is parallel to the subway, but again, it's like it's a bit with Second Avenue. It's uh, the subway. This is not going to be depicted, so let me show it to you with cursor. The subway goes like this. It goes on Flatbush, Eastern Parkway, then Nostrand. That's the two and five trains, and it terminates here at Brooklyn College. So this has a ton of bus ridership as people from southeastern Brooklyn connect to the subway. Um, Flatbush was a top 10 corridor in the city like maybe 15 years ago and at this point it's still top 20. So again, connect to the subway. Utica, it's people here, connect to the subway. Uh, the Eastern Parkway line connect, continues here. This is, no strand is one branch. The other connect, continues direct and both express and local trains serve Utica. Uh, if you want to go on, on other subway lines, there's uh, other subway lines that again serve Utica, like um, Fulton. So I, I, um, so I kept calling, pretty sure I kept calling this Eastern Parkway. This is Eastern Parkway, I'm sorry. So Flatbush, Eastern Parkway, no strand. You can even see the little subway roll signs, or MTA roll signs, or Eastern Parkway, uh, Fulton Street, same thing. Um, so this means that the buses, so if you think this means that the buses are mostly an outer urban thing, that is correct. Um, I think on New York City transit buses, all this way there was going to be on paper numbers. The, technically the borough with the highest ridership was either Brooklyn or the Bronx, but this is because a lot of the Queens buses are technically something called the MTA bus company, which is for all intents and purposes the same as New York City transit as far as the riders are concerned. So. For all intents and purposes, Queens has the most bus ridership in New York City, which, again, it's what you should be expecting. It has worse subway coverage in the Bronx. Um, there are 
a bunch of really strong buses, um, which again, mostly go where the subway doesn't. Is there exceptions? You don't need to tell me them. I'm aware of things like Grand Concourse. Grand Concourse has the BMD trains and also BX1 and 2. But for the most part, it's either east-west shit. So um, Fordham and a bunch of other corridors. Or north-south in the subway desert between the 2.5, which is here, and uh, the more west side oriented subway lines. I'm going to the website because the, the, the West Bronx subway, let's call it now. West side, which is where it's going to happen, which are Grand Concourse and Jerome. So there's a bunch of bus ridership on Southern, on Third, on Webster. Um, so generally, the buses feed the subway, and in American cities, it's actually been like this for a while now. Um, not all of them. In Washington, um, there's a lot of contention because Washington has no fair integration between the buses and metro buses have a flat fare in the district metro has distance based fares um, which are higher than those on the buses which means that if you switch from an old bus trip to a bus metro trip but wait, so, 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 okay let me clarify what i mean by switch not switches in transfer if you change your itinerary from taking a bus all the way from your residence to your destination to if instead of taking that trip, you take a bus to Metro trip, you pay extra. This was very contentious when Metro was extended to Anacostia um, because Anacostia is uh, a very poor neighborhood. And as a result, yeah, people would be getting faster trips through better buses to Anacostia and then connect to Metro. But they didn't really have the income for it um, unless they were going to do big changes to their budgeting and you know and so instead they just stayed on all bus trips for the most part and there was a big um civil rights contention too this is it, this is not just a point it's for black neighborhoods so it got into a lot of issues of racial disparate impact um but again that's pretty unique to dc um the norm in the united states is bus subway either perfect or mostly okay fair integration like in boston there's a bit of a fair difference but it's not big uh in new york it's fair integrated in um i think in chicago there's a bit of a fair difference i don't remember um but but the point is that the buses do feed the subway and in chicago by the way again i don't remember if there's no fair difference or a little one but the buses feed the app um to the point that and it's something we're gonna uh, we're gonna mention in both new york and chicago so i think about the bus grid um and this is where the fact that this is a kind of new computer and i still don't have uh all the bus maps on all of the of all of the boroughs saved so i'm gonna need to do this so i'm gonna show you something about the queen's bus map and then meanwhile chicago bus map because they're gonna show you the exact same thing um maybe it's going to be clearer in chicago actually um because chicago has a much more regular grid than queens let's try to look at this and hope that it's not going to be clear. so this is the queen's bus map okay five three seven one they're used to it. Okay, this is good enough for what I need. All right. So, Chicago has a very regular grid. I'm gonna switch from New York to Chicago for a sec. Um, so Chicago has a very regular grid. And um, you could literally say this to the point that you could give coordinates using the grid. And uh, the L, Going north goes to an even past city limits because the purple line goes to Aven to, to, to Avonston to, to Northwestern. Um, but to the south, it doesn't go all the way to city limits. Um, so the main artery for north south trips is not the north. It's there's something called the south side main line, which is the old one, it's this one, it's the green line. This is called the Dan, Ryan, the Dan Ryan branch. It's in the median of the Dan Ryan, it is much faster than the green line and uh 
it go and it penetrates further. I think this is the ant, maybe. It looks like an ant station at least. Yeah. Um. So, the ant station is ninety fifth Street. The numbers are south. Of the no so the grid in Chicago has coordinates, but the streets are only numbered um, going south, so not going west or going north. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this is different. This is... Um, so, th this, yeah, this, this is different from the... DC issue. This is where um, often what you're saying with this is that um, the trains are good enough to get ridership from people who are not desperately poor and the buses aren't. Or sometimes it's just exaggerated. Like in LA, there's a widespread belief that this is the case and this is bullshit. Um, rail riders in LA are poorer than the general population as well. They're richer than bus riders, but they're actually poorer and less white than engineers in general. And by the way, something that I only discovered a couple of days ago while hunting some demographic data is that even on Long Island, um, on Long Island transit riders, by which I mean mostly LIRR, um, they're actually less white than Long Island. Um, whiter than, let's say, New York City because it's still Long Island. But um, so, so even though in both Nassau and Suffolk counties, um, the average income for a, a transit commuter, which mostly means LIRR rider, is 50% higher than that of a uh, solo driver. Uh, transit commuters are also something like 60% men um, on Long Island, which is atypical. Normally, transit commuters are have a slight female majority. Um, they're actually less white than Nassau and Suffolk counties, I guess because the people who move to Long Island to work in the city are more recent migration wave, which is less likely to be white, whereas the whereas a lot of the like old tiny white people on Long Island made sure to like not no, not even have to be in the city for work. Um. Okay, so about b best rail bus integration, Paris or Seoul? I don't know Seoul very well. Paris, Paris bus rail integration is kind of weird because there's no real reason for Paris proper to run buses. So we're talking about a more suburban thing. Um. So we're talking about the model of can the buses feed the outer end of the trains, and I think they do, but this is purely based on the things that I vaguely saw while going to uh, IHS and Beale City Effect. So cut that up, Dorn. And, and the point here in making about Chicago, anyway, is that the Dan Ryan branch terminates in 95th, but there's a bunch of east-west bus service past that. So what does it do? It doesn't go all the way on 103rd. Um, the... The, the important streets are mostly um, the ones that are, uh, what, the, the, mostly the ones that are 3 mod 8, so 79th, 87th, 95th, 103rd, 111th. Um, and the ones here go straight across because the point is to feed the L here, here, here. Okay, here, they get the breaks of the a little bit. Um, wait, did I say 3 mod 8? I meant 7 mod 8. 3 mod 8 is like 115. Um, yeah, so things are sort of 7 mod 8. Um, so 63rd. Uh, Garfield is 55th. It goes all the way across, and this also hits the green line. So that's the one that I took when I roamed around your Chicago. Um, 69th is... Kind of should be seventy first, but it's sixty, but it's sixty ninth. Um, and I guess the bus is even numbered sixty seven because I guess the numbers matter. And then seventy ninth, eighty seventh, ninety fifth, and then on one o third, the bus doesn't go all the way. It goes, it, it diverts to ninety fifth, one eleventh, same, one fifteenth. Uh, on slightly circuitous route because they also want to possibly feed commuter rail, but the commuter rail is not the important thing. Um, and for 103rd east of the L, you take a different route, the, one, um, the 106. Um, so this is what happens 
just because the buses aren't supposed to feed the L, and they do a good job at it. But the L doesn't go all the way, so the, they have these plans to extend the L farther south. I don't remember by what alignment. And um, this is so this is what you see in Chicago with buses feeding the L. Why would London do better than Paris with buses? I don't know. Remember that London does not have bus rail fare integration, and London is cheap bus, expensive rail. So a lot of it is just trying to yeet poor people to the buses and keep the underground for. Um, I'm not going to say the Tories at this point, but keep the underground for people who don't hate the Adam Smith Institute. Um, now, New York has the same model, buses feed the train. So, know how, while the subway exists, the buses are kind of coherent north-south. Here it's a little less coherent because at some point the train gets so closely spaced you just walk. But you can kind of see these routes, things like Lefferts, um, and then past Jamaica and Flushing, the buses just go radial into Jamaica and Flushing. So they have all these routes. Again, not all of them, like Union Turnpike is just east-west radial hitting Kew Gardens. Um, but then you have all these routes that are just mostly there to feed Jamaica, the, the subway in Jamaica. So there would be so some of them go east-west, like Hillside, and then the others are just look. Um, things like Linden or um, Murdoch. I think the main ones are, I think the main ones by ridership are Brewer and Merrick, so these. And yeah, technically there are routes that don't do that, like the three. Um, so I think the three still diverts here at the subway um i actually don't think there's a single route that just goes clean north south without diverting to the subway so farmers does this it's kind of weird circumferential between the f the jfk and the a and then here francis lewis it's a 77 goes like this and yeah it diverts to at the subway, and then for instance, Lewis to the north is a different route. 77, not 77, 76. Um, so this one does not divert with flushing, but it does go like this, and yep, this looks like a diversion to hit the F. So it's not a very coherent system if you're trying to travel through north south, um, even on streets that are pretty important, like um, like Francis Lewis, I guess on Spring. Springfield maybe, but even that's not really all the way. And wait, no, the twenty-seven goes like this. Maybe loops around and then goes radial and hits flushing. Yeah, no, no, these are just not straight north-south anything. Um, and this is where commuter rail comes in. So the point is that these are, uh. Yeah, I have ASI jokes too, but I mean, um, so so the point is that commuter rail in this context is just really good at making the bus system more coherent because in New York or in Chicago, look in Chicago if the if Metro Electric were actually good, by which I mean, I think it actually. Might be pretty close to fare integrated. I don't remember. I don't think the fares are the big premium over the other thing. That's what I recall. I think they don't have free transfers is the main thing, but otherwise, the fares aren't too bad. But if they had actual fare integration and if they had good frequency, which they used to in the, in the days of the North Central, I keep forgetting if the trains actually ran. I think the trains on the trunk maybe were even ran every ten minutes or something. I had fare rates, and this was already kind of untenable and there was a big frequency cut when Metro took over. Uh, and one of the things with American commuter rail is they really like their express trains, so they just skip all the SETI stops. Um, I think this, uh, when, when I took the trains there, I'm pretty sure I had a one hour wait. I mean, not a full hour wait, like maybe 30 minutes or something, but it was an hourly train. I think. 
Um, and that's just ridiculous. Um, it's within the city limits of Chicago. It's not especially suburban part of Chicago. To the contrary, it's the University of Chicago. It's the biggest employment center in the city outside the loop. Like this needs is every 10 minutes at worst. I'll speak. Um, and once you do that, I mean, if you get to the point where even the branches here are decent, then, okay, so with the branches that are um, at 95th or north, that's okay because the buses still, because the buses don't change. But past 95th, like if this were sufficiently frequent, and again, sufficiently frequent does not mean half an hour or whatever copium a lot of American planners are on, I mean, start from 10 minutes think about doing better than 10 minutes um think about, i'm not saying you do measurements but st but 10 minutes minimum so here and here that's a uh, rock island i think then what you do is you run these buses direct um, on 103rd direct on i have no idea what it's called oh right because it's the same thing direct on 111 um and this is actually a lot more efficient because you have fewer diversions. You don't really have these really congested bus loops. Now, I don't know how much congestion there is here at 95th and Dan Ryan. Um, I do know the situation of this in New York City. Commuter rail and or subway extensions, but the commuter rail exists and the subway doesn't. And, um, and that matters. Yeah, yeah it kind of blinds the traffic, but it doesn't matter because it serves different places like the um the, uh, like there's a park in between these places in, in between the l and hyde park um now i guess the issue is that hyde park is a little bit like georgetown in washington See, i mean not not in the sense in the sense of being very rich it really isn't but in the sense of university traffic wasn't deemed important in the middle of the 20th century and for all i know it actually was not um, universities were less important employment centers than, than they are now. Um, they didn't generate a lot of commuters and people were thinking in terms of commuters. That's why the Washington Metro does not serve Georgetown. The explanation you usually hear is racism. It's kind of like Georgetown residents didn't want a subway that would take, uh, didn't want subway access because they wanted to be exclusive, but that's pretty bullshit. Other rich parts of the city do get served, um, like farther up. Um, the, the reason they didn't serve Georgetown is that they didn't think it was important because Georgetown just did not have enough commuters bound to downtown DC, which was the market they were thinking about serving. Um, and, and, and it's the same way, I guess, with UChicago. Um, not actually a lot of people commute from UChicago to the Loop. Why would they? They're students there to UChicago. Like the, like you don't live in Hyde Park in order to commute to the Loop. Um, you just don't. So um, so it's a traffic generator, which I think may have broken people's brains. Um, and I doubt that the, um, and, and again, and, and again, I mean, even if they were serving it, this is also a type of trip that has become much more important subsequently to the Metro takeover. Um, and so yeah, the, um, so, so this is something we could absolutely learn on incredibly frequently and then maybe a little less frequently here and here but which again i mean something like 10 minutes on a branch three minutes on the trunk like i'm like chicago is a big city it's okay for metro electric to be running berlin s-bahn frequencies and with new york it's kind of the same thing in new york um yeah some subway expansion is prudent i mean not at current costs but current costs are not set in stone or anything like that um and so the this exists like this commuter line exists this commuter line also exists so what you want to do is you want to be running better north south buses that instead of all connecting to flushing where there is a lot of traffic like the, the this does jam the buses this jams the buses these loops so what you want to do is first of all make the commuter trains good enough 
probably with some info here so that you don't have a giant number of passengers taking all these buses that are right next to the commuter lines kind of ridiculous here um as, as i said merrick and brewer i think are the are the most important routes in saudi springs by at least judging by actually i don't remember if i looked at frequency or at um uh, uh at frequency or at uh ridership or both i think both but um and and that way you can start running Contiguo service on Francis Lewis and Springfield. Presumably you would open some infill stations on the commuter trains to hit them. This is pretty important. Um, you would run nor more north-south. You would serve destinations that are off the subway, things like Wayne's College, which is not on the subway. Um, I guess that you can serve on Main Street. But um, the... Uh, and the, or St. John's or whatever. And so the... Uh, and, and so this is just going to get you way more efficiency than making people from this area take a bus all the way here instead of just going bell and change to the commuter train. Like, we get, let's actually check where people here work in Betars. Um, after a short break for turning on the light. Yeah, so um, let's actually check this because usually the situation with uh, suburban commuters or out very outer urban commuters is that their transportation needs are pretty downtown centric. So for example, in Boston, when they uh, opened the Green Line D branch, the, the more suburban one, um, they specifically made sure at the time that every D branch train would actually hit downtown Boston rather than do so some of the branches had forced transfers. Uh, um, uh, um, is this Kensington? It can more of Kensington. Kensington is in is a neighborhood is a neighborhood of New York and a neighborhood of Philadelphia. Um. So I think at the time there were some forced transfers and they made sure that the D branch wouldn't because the D branch riders were the ones who were most likely to be working in downtown Boston. Um, whereas the um, travel needs from Alston and Brighton were maybe more diffuse or something, like more, more local. And yeah, so and on the map, let's check what's going on in beta. For some reason, the internet's being slow, and I don't know why. And I keep thinking it's Europe, but no, it's not Europe. The internet here is just kind of slow. Which is something I always remind my, which is not my mind, something I'm always reminded of whenever I upload videos when I'm at a hotel and not at home, because at home, videos on my old computer they were at a lower resolution i think you hear the i think on my old computer they uploaded at about the same speed that they were being that they were playing back at it's here and here it might be even the same and not even slightly faster so a two hour video takes about two hours to upload and then i go to and then when i'm not at home and I upload in a hotel in the US or Denmark or something, suddenly instead of two hours it takes uh, 20 minutes. Um, so let's just let this load so I get the exact Beitaras um, and not 
names of things like that, and then let's check where people work because in What do you mean Houston is in in what way do you consider Houston to be the New York of the South? Um, like what exactly do you think of when you think of the, the New York of X? So okay, so let's check where so Bay Terrace is up to here. So it's up to here, I guess. Um draw polygon. Do I want to include Fort Totem? Yeah, why not? Even though it's not going to end up being terribly important in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Confirm, and then we need advanced selection, which is the entirety of New York City. So, counties. I'm mean, going to kind of factually assume that people here are going to take trains for jobs that are not in Manhattan, which, spoiler alert, there aren't. You know, so let's ignore Staten Island. We normally don't do it, but I mean, at this point, it, it really does not matter. The transit demand from Bay Terrace to Staten Island is zero and also more importantly, it would have taken me too long to get it to load. Yeah, so so I'm still kind of curious what you mean when you say that this is the New York is the that Houston is the New York of the South because I think when I think of New York, okay, so eighteen hundred people, and this had better and, and I had better not made an error. Nope, this I did make an error. Eighteen hundred people, okay, work in this area and live in the city. X Staten Island, where I kind of doubt it matters. So I'm just going to look at this and then we're going to flip to what I should have looked at, which is people living here and working here. Yeah, so this is very diffuse. Um, mostly local, some brand in Queenstown's, where, yeah, I mean, look, from here, people should just be taking the um, port. Washington branch here and then a short bus, not subway to Flushing and then a much longer bus. Um, no. Confirm advanced selection. Paired and home is first. Work is advanced. Should be more than 1800 because Bay Terrace should be a residential neighborhood. Yeah, not 1.8, but 4.4. It's the largest city, okay, but it's not... Okay, but what do you mean by largest city? So, Dallas is a bigger metro area. Houston is a bigger city center, but... Or better, or a bit better, or a bigger... Um, municipality, but that doesn't matter very much. Um, it just annexed more suburbs. Um, and yeah, it has a slightly bigger central business district, but only slightly. Um, in no way is Houston a primate city or anything, because yeah, I, or first of all, it's not even the biggest, but Dallas, which is the biggest, um, is um, not dominant in any way. Like Dallas and Houston are pretty symmetric with each other. Atlanta is almost as big. Miami is almost as big. I guess Miami is not meaningfully Southern, but yeah, so we so a bunch work in Flushing. Um and honestly even for them not getting a, a one seat driver doing flip flip is um um faster, but look how much Manhattan there is. I guess that this is a fake number, the um downtown Brooklyn just because of uh public sector artifacts. Um okay, so four point four, okay, and I'm gonna Check what happened if I just do this, if I just do Manhattan. So the 4.4 .4 become how, much, how many? Two maybe? It's difficult to tell from the thermal. Yeah. 
well, it was ready to be off by a pretty big factor, and then they said 2000, and it's 1987. Yeah, so, yeah, so this is a place that I won't say, I don't want to say it's actually Manhattan dominated because um, 2000 out of 4.4 thousand is actually slightly less than Manhattan's dominance, I think, and so I think Manhattan is a slight majority maybe 50 something percent of city jobs and this is slightly less than 50,000 but it's also 50,000 maybe not 50,000 also 50 percent 50 something percent when you include people who live in Manhattan almost all of them work in Manhattan or like very close to Manhattan and this is pretty far out so still quite a lot of Manhattan um yeah so if they work near Penn Station they should just be taking the train all the way, like they like busing to the LIR, taking the LIR all the way. Um, and if it's not near Penn Station, then there, then there should be a cross platform transfer at Sunnyside Junction to East Side Axis, which gets them to Grand Central pretty cleanly. Um, and yeah, this is how you can do these kind of connect these kinds of connections. Yeah, LA is not Southern, LA is Southern California. LA is, LA is West Coast. Yeah, so LA is the New York of the West Coast for the most part. And I say for the most part, because when I think of what, what does it mean to be New York? So here are the features that I think of when I think of New York. First of all, it is very large. So the so, so a lot of the stuff about New York follows from its just sheer size. For example, it is a center of uh, finance, media, professional services. Um, that all comes from its size. And this is something that we can literally trace in the history of Canada, in which um, the professional services moved from Montreal to Toronto as Toronto grew bigger than Montreal. Um, it used to be that Canadian finance was centered on, uh, was, was centered on, uh, was centered on uh, Montreal. It was firms that would entirely speak English, um, leading to a lot of local friction. Um, but Toronto was over time growing faster than Montreal and it became bigger, just the, the, the finance firms bolted. Um, and, the, and, and the same, so I don't know about the history of Canadian media, but media also likes being in the, in the biggest city if, if there is a primate city, um, London, Paris, Tokyo, whatever. Um, and in the United States, it's New York. Um, now in Germany there's no primate city, which means that a lot of things are split. So the finance here is in Frankfurt. Media here um, is not as it's not especially centered on one place the way it might be in London or um, I think all of the major Canadian dailies are in Toronto. I'm not sure, um, or are in Paris, of course. Um, but Hamburg has a fair amount of concentration just because it's where both Axel Springer and Die Zeit are, and I think also Deutsche Spiegel, and, and also Spiegel. Yeah, it's Montréal. Um, literally Mount Royal. Um, um, yeah, and so the... Um, so New York is a primate city through its sheer size. Um, that is an important feature. Um, it is economically diverse, where the diversity means a lot of different industries that are, again, mostly professional services and other big city things. Uh, and uh, yeah, Germany is well known to be more polycentric than uh, France or the United Kingdom. This is the excuse Germans tell them. Germans tell themselves for why we don't have a Tejava network. Um, and um, the um, but New York is also very wealthy. This is also a really important feature. Um, and again, Germany is kind of decentralized in the sense that the wealthiest city in Germany is not Hamburg and it's not Frankfurt. It's um, it's München. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Um, but um, the I mean, people also call uh, think you use very ape-like terminology to talk about politicians. Um, things like the peanut gallery, I think, is a monkey. Like monkey at the zoo type terminology. Um, but um, but 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 anyway, so New York is very large. It is economically diverse, subject to the idea that it's all corporate HQs and uh, um, professional services. Just as a reminder, Pfizer is headquartered in New York City. So it's not just fine. Like, like people think about finance, but Pfizer is headquartered in New York City, and I'm pretty sure their biggest production sites are in Jersey. Um, the spiral, is that Hudson Yards? Yeah. Um, and um, this, in, in turn, even attracts companies that are headquartered elsewhere. For example, Google's largest office outside the Googleplex is in New York. You would think it would help. It does, in fact, help. The problem is Germany has not actually built such a network. Like, this is why Germany does not have as strong a high-speed rail network as France. The part about how, the, the part about polycentricity is pure copian. Um, and so, so when I think of New York, so, so, so when I think of New York, I think again, size, um, a very headquarters-based economy like Paris. I mean, Paris does not have an industry the way that Munich has cars and whatever you call Siemens or Frankfurt has finance, or Hamburg has media, or, or whatever, but Paris has the, Paris's economic role is, it's the capital of France. London's economic role is partly finance, but also partly it's the capital of the United Kingdom. And I'm sorry, Borners, I mean the United Kingdom, not England. Um, Scotland doesn't really have an economy. Um, yeah, the issue, yes, okay, so France could build a, build a first line, but in Germany, Germany built that first line. Germany built the first line shortly after France did. France did, like, Germany was not moping forever about which line to start building. Um, Germany actually did build early lines and then kind of stopped because these lines were designed around weird bypasses. Um... <laughs> yeah, the part where um, Scotland is a little bit Norwegian in the sense of talking about how progressive it is and then the economy is their oil and gas is a little weird. Um, but anyway, the, the point is that these are the features I think of for New York and on the West Coast, these don't coexist. Um, yeah, yeah, Japan, yeah, yeah, Japan has Osaka, but Tokyo is, Tokyo is still a larger share of Japan's population than Paris and London are of their respective countries. And New York, yeah, so New York has a kind of primate city economy and nothing in California is like that. So on the West Coast, the largest city is LA. LA has a diversity. LA has the, um, has the amazing food, except that you need to drive an hour to get to it. Um, and um, LA also doesn't really have a primate city economy. I mean, LA has manufacturing. LA has a lot of culture economy, which I mean, Hollywood. Uh, but that doesn't actually generate that much of an economy. LA is not a very wealthy place. Um, I've heard it d described by one of the MBs on Twitter as LA has the incomes of North Carolina. I think, I think the incomes of Raleigh and the rents of New York. Um, San Francisco is the wealth. San Francisco is the um, extravagant wealth from the tech industry. Um, yeah, LA has a port, but in the year of our Jew who believed his mother when she told him that he was God and she was a virgin, 2023, ports don't really drive your economy. I mean... Rotterdam exists, and Rotterdam, yeah, it's a nice urban economy. It's not the economic center of the Netherlands in any way, shape, or form. 
Um, and also South Holland is notably poorer than North Holland. And, and Utrecht. Utrecht is a loaded one. I believe. Um, and so, um, so, so this is what I am thinking when I say the New York roughly. I think, I think it's really important for there to be a primate city. So Toronto is the New York of Canada. Germany <laughs> lacks a New York. In Italy, if you squint your eyes, there is a New York and it's called Milano. But you need to squint your eyes because um, forget that Milano is not a political capital. New York is not a political capital either. Milano is not actually that large. Um, um, and I think Milan is the, is the main corporate HQ city, but I think he also splits that with a few other places like Torino or, or Rome. Um, so yeah. Um, so no, Houston, so we would not call any other American city the New York of X. Um, unless we're talking about very small regions, like Boston is the New York of New England or some shit, sure. But also, not a lot of people live in New England. Toronto is not New York run by the Swiss. Toronto is New York run by people who have giant cultural cringe to work New York and London. Why is Napoli so big? I don't know. Um, historically, it was the largest city in Italy, but I mean, a lot of water has passed under that bridge since. It's entirely possible that however shit Napoli is, the rest of southern Italy is even shit, is even worse shit, so people just move there, but I don't actually know. Um, yeah, so... Um, look, bear in mind, Napoli... We can mark it for being poor, but something that Marco explained to me a couple of years ago when we were writing the construction cost report is that I was asking whether um, there were big differences in worker wages between different parts of Italy, and he said there are very small differences. And I said, but wait, I mean, I'm looking at these income figures, and I know that um, Lombardy is like twice as rich as Campania. And he, and he said, yeah, because all the professional services workers are in Lombardy or maybe in Rome and not in Campania. Um, whereas if you're like a construction worker, yeah, you earn more in Milan than in Napoli, but the difference is not that big. Um, I have no idea. You Oh, you mean Megalopolis, like boss wash? I mean, it's mo I mean the problem is because I, I mostly saw it in an American context, it was just... Mo it was mostly just random data viz. It didn't actually mean very much. It's kind of, or in the context of the European blue banana, so this shit, um, which is kind of remarkable in how wrong it was as a as a concept. Um, like the idea was that this is where growth is, and then it turns out, and then so this is a concept from 1989. Since then, first of all, France actually France kind of grows on a par, not very well, but kind of. And then, and the and, and Paris was very explicitly excluded from the blue banana, from the blue banana. Um, let's see. Since then, essentially, growth rates are, um, have been entirely about nation states, or like member states, and not about uh, uh, and, and not about specific regionalization. So all of Italy has stagnated in the last thirty or so years. Um, the north south gap hasn't meaningfully grown no the north and the south have had shit economic growth in italy uh in germany actually some of these parts these parts were not the ones that had the fastest economic growth because convergence between the east and the west um so essentially the idea that growth doesn't really depend on member state level policy has been just wrong um so as an so as a european concept this made certain productions which turned out to be false in the united states i mostly think of america 2050 and the attempt to kind of divide the united states into weird mega regions that i don't think worked very much i don't think the blue banana made sense in 1900 either um in 1900 there was not a lot of trade between different countries in, in Europe, or at least not between big ones, the there was a lot of international trade, but it was within imperial systems or but, or within certain blocks, like lots of trade between France and Russia, but not actually that much between 
the UK, France, and Germany. The idea that France and Germany are each other's biggest trading partners is a post-war um, construct leading to in, in leading to a paradigm shift in how economists conceive of international trade, for which the economist who won a Nobel Prize is Paul Krugman um, with new trade theory. What do you mean that's actually wrong? Like the, the I mean, Britain's, I mean, if you want to go look at where British uh, investment went in that era, it mostly went to the Dominions and French investment went, I'm forgetting to how much to the colonies, but to Russia. Um, certainly the late 19th, in the, in the late 19th century, you look at where British investment went, like where, where um, uh, where, where British foreign investment went, um, it was in, was the Boston, yes, in the Romancer, the idea is that you have this sprawl that goes all the way between Boston and Atlanta, um, where, I know, I don't remember the sprawl making a big impression on me when I read the Romancer, whereas the earlier sections, the one about, the one about Chiba made a much stronger impression. Um, so France right now, um, yeah, okay, all of this is, uh, Europe or the United States. Um, it's one of the things that I should know, except I don't because I only played Tradal twice rather than my recently kicked obsession with Wordle, with OG Wordle. But yeah, this is France. Um, whereas it was doing a lot of trade with Russia in uh, like up until World War One. Germany might actually have, if this is pre-war, this, this would have a lot of trade with Russia, but no. Yeah, so, yeah, so the majority of Germany's trade is with other countries in the Union. And uh, pretty and a pretty hefty share of the rest is countries that pretend that they're not in the Union, but for all intents and purposes are, but which I mean the UK and Switzerland. Um, I think there's also a bunch with Norway, like a, like think, I'm forgetting, but I, I believe Norway, Switzerland, and uh, the UK are the like three of the top five trade partners of the EU or something. Um, no, not top five, but yeah. Um, like the EU is not actually that great dependent. Yeah, there is, there is a bit. The United States in 1900 had a ton of it, um, which is mentioned in Kirkland's Nobel lecture about how each city in the manufacturing belt specialized in a different thing. But, um, it was, uh, and, and he compares it with the situation of today where what the hell does Atlanta produce exactly um, in, in, in a, in a post-industrial country, but um, the, uh, but the specialization, but the, 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 but the, but the growth in trade between similar countries is a recent thing. Um, and yeah, sure, and more food stuff, but that's, specific to agriculture, and this is very specific to Britain. Um, where, for example, France, I don't think France ever imported food. Um, the Ukraine and Germany famously did and still do. Um, France didn't um, and doesn't. Um, the Netherlands, I think, has always been basically self-sufficient in food. Um, so, so I don't think the blue banana would really matter for, for 1900 either. I don't think if it, wait, how, how wealthy was, wait, wait, in, in, in Germany, also importantly with the blue banana, um, the other reason I'm dumping on it in a, in a, an anti, in, in an antebellum context is that I would not 
conceive of the economy of Germany in 1900 as looking like this. The economy of Germany in 1900, yeah, sure, there's the rhine ruhr region, very industrialized, but Berlin and Saxony, whereas conversely, southern Germany was not industrialized. In, in the aftermath of World War II, um, the quip was that Britain got the industry, the United States got the um, got the nice views, and France got the wine. Fran French occupation zone, American occupation zone, British occupation zone. Um, like, if you want to do this for Germany in 1900, you would need to. It might even have been a north south thing, kind of, like industry in Saxony and in the Ruhr. And the and Berlin was a private city at the time. Berlin was the wealthiest part of Germany. Um, yeah, Frankfurt existed, but Frankfurt was not the bigger thing. The the Reichsbank was not in Frankfurt. Um, but anyway, so so before so yeah so anyway, this is why I'm dumping on the concept of a mega region, both in the US and in Europe. It just is wrong. Um. And, um, yeah, so in, so, so anyway, so this also means that transportation should still f think in terms of metropolitan areas, unless you're doing intercity and then intercity, sure, in broader terms, but it doesn't matter if you're mega region or not mega region. Yeah, the Northeast Carter is a thing, but that's essentially the only thing you're thinking of internal to a mega region, because and any other American mega region in Mount Hudu, which is again, it's America tw um, 2050. These are not how you, I mean, this is not how you should think of as, uh, this is not how you should think of mega regions. Oh, uh, sorry, high-speed rail. High-speed rail connects regions to each, connects different regions. It doesn't connect, it's not internal to a region usually. Just looking for the map. Um, New York's next comeback. This is no longer Petra's last name. Um, I'm just looking at the map. I just want the map, guys. Like this is the map. Um, but anyway, yeah. Sure, but it misses the it misses so much German heavy industry because Sa remember Saxony was an important industrial region. Saxony had the highest population growth of the major German states, unless you count Hamburg or Bremen, um, up to like World War One. Um, it grew faster than Prussia. I mean, it didn't grow faster than specific parts of Prussia like Berlin or the Ruhr, but it grew faster than Prussia. Um, and yeah, it was all pre-World War One heavy industry shit, but welcome to Wallonia. Um, or no pas de calais. I just want the map. Okay, so this is half of the map. So you see how Northern California and Southern California are different mega regions, but obviously the purpose of high speed rail is to connect this to this and not this or this. Likewise, this is bullshit, but this would be a kind of cool corridor. Um, I guess you can crown your high speed rail to this, but I'm skeptical. This is being done, but look how they're not even sure about the Texas Triangle versus the um the Gulf Coast. The, the Gulf Coast. Um likewise here, yeah. Okay, so for some reason Richmond and um Hampton Roads are not in a mega region. Even though they have pretty strong ties to DC. Um but the point is that you don't, it's not you build a rail line here and you build a rail line like this. No, you build this and then you build this and this. 
maybe also this if you really want to. Or like was, this is a surprisingly strong intercity card. Also, this is not a mega region. What way is, you know, in what way are Jax and Miami in the same mega region? So anyway, this is my thought about metropolitan, about, about mega, mega, megalopolitan regions. In one word, lev. Um, so, um, the, so anyway, going back to the issue of, um, commuter rail bus interface, what you really want is to be able to connect here, I mean, again, people here mostly work in Manhattan, yeah, you can give them some express buses, uh, the two letter things like Queens and Manhattan, these are express buses, um, which is all fun and games until you realize that these are giant financial drains because these don't have any turn any seat turnover and um they have the operating cost of a bus buses are already kind of not financially very good so you charge to so i guess at this point to seven to 90 but you charge up until maybe a month or two ago to 75 dollars for a trip that averages three kilometers and these charge yeah they charge more they charge twice but the trip i think averages something like 20 kilometers um, this is a point where I'm going to just go on Mastodon, not to shitpost or anything, but because I was talking about this, uh, and then watch how... And that's here. Average trip length is this. Um, yeah, this is why you should try to avoid doing express buses. Uh, and I bring all this up because this means that when you're trying to serve this part of the city with public transport, this, like the QM numbers, they waste resources. They waste, they're a giant waste of resources. Um, what they should be doing is beefing this up and beefing this up, the LIRR. Um, it's faster this way. The LIRR still offers you a long trip on one train. It's a two-seat ride and not a one-seat ride, but this is pretty short. Um, and, you have, and you have a pretty long trip. I think it's like 15 or 20 minutes if the trains are fast. Maybe a bit more if the trains are slow. It's like 20 minutes or something from Bayside to... Um, Penn Station, and the bus is going to do the entire thing in like I don't know, an hour. No, the the, the express buses are slow pokes. Uh, and yeah, so it's faster, and you don't need to pay a driver on each bus because you have a driver on a much bigger train. Um, much more beneficial, and so people might even decide to actually visit the to visit Manhattan more. Or to visit Flushing, just because these buses don't really help you get to anything nice in Flushing. Look at how all these buses don't stop in the center of Flushing, because that's the congest. Um, so what you really want is to do this in, a, in, in an area like Baytars. Um, and again, same is true of Chicago. So, so far I've talked about improving operations on commuter rail, which mostly just means frequency, but now we need to talk about infill stops. I'm going to talk about Toronto and then I'm going to talk about LA because I did promise Toronto tour that I'm going to talk about LA and I hate breaking promises. I'm not going to be very good in politics. So in Toronto, um, the commuter rail system is very American style in that, and I really hope that if I zoom enough, it will show me the stop spacing. Um, the stop spacing on American commuter rail is the stop, the trains barely stop in the city and then they make a lot of stops in the suburbs. And I really hope that I can, you know, something open rail and that is much more reliable about it usually than, um, within Google Earth. We don't need New York or... No, you do not get access to my location. Stop asking.
So this is Union Station, Exhibition, Mimico, Port Credit. I guess the stop pacing doesn't actually tighten that much. You can kind of, I mean, you can kind of see how this is wider than this. These are the more suburban ones. Um, but also the ridership at these, at the suburban ones, like I think the busiest stop. I, I at one point someone w um, told me what the busiest suburban, so not Toronto Union Station stops are on uh, um, on go, and I don't think any of them was in the city. It was always the big suburban one, so maybe Clarkson, Oakville. Um, I don't remember if anything here, if any of the non lecture Mississauga were uh, on the other side. I don't remember. Maybe oh, I don't. I, I I don't remember. But um, it was a bunch here and a bunch here in the suburbs. Um, and the thing is, you need way more urban stops to make it a usable urban service, which is something that they vaguely got at the Toronto RER concept, but only vaguely. Lots of resistance to it. So um, what you really need is to have these stop at every intersection with a major bus. Um, even New York d gets that wrong. Um, I say even New York as if New York is an, an example of something good. Um, Penn Station access. Yeah, and this is Astoria, so here, which is silly, but it also misses the connection to the Ford and buses here. There is going to be a stop at Co-op City, which is here, which is measured and it, it's modeled as very high ridership on the theory that people are going to drive here or take a bus here. And I think the plan is to kind of move the B12, BX12 a little so it will hit here. Um, but that's much more of a of going out, that's kind of going out of the way, whereas here is a much better connection point and, and make crayons, which are not in this computer yet. Um, this is where you should be stopping in addition to something here. And um, I don't actually know if you need, and, and I mentioned, no, I, I, I do know, I mentioned some info at Springfield, uh, at the intersection with Springfield when I was talking about these lines. Um, so in Toronto, they need to do some of that infill so that the buses can better feed that. The buses in Toronto are a grid. Um, so they just want to work with the grid. And then there is LA. How legit is the excuse that Astoria Station could hold like four cars and would be disruptive? Um, not legit at all. Like the main complaint was that it was not modeled to have high ridership because they were assuming bad commuter rail practices like premium fares and low frequency at a place where people can just take the subway. Um, that's why Astoria was rejected. The construction difficulties, yeah, they were there, but I mean, they were not the main reason. Um, now in LA, the buses, so, uh, so should you be for how in Chicago and New York, the buses have these diversions in LA, it's not like that in Los Angeles bus map and we'll see if I actually get something interesting. Um like these look like kinda of nice out of those but Getty Center. Okay. Hopefully this is these are what I'm looking for. Okay. Yeah that sounds about right. So this looks like so in LA this, this is the subway, right? So the subway is the red line to North Hollywood and the purple line to Wilshire and Western. Um, I think they changed their names so they're no longer called by color and I never remember the new names. I'm like A line, B line, D line. Um, so these are slightly older names, I guess. Do they even have the East Side Gold Line here? Yeah. That, wait, I thought the East Side Gold Line opened before. Yeah, there's no X line. There's no East Side Gold Line. But, um, but yeah. So note that in LA, the subway terminates here at Wilshire and Western. Um, 
the north-south lines stay north-south. The north-south lines aren't trying to divert to connect to Wilshire and Western, with the exception of Crenshaw, where there just isn't anything to connect it to the north. Um, I need to show you guys what it's like. So Wilshire and Western, okay, so this is Vermont and Western. So I think this is, yeah, this is Vermont and Western, and this is Wilshire and Western. No, Vermont and Western, uh, Wilshire and Vermont. Vermont is parallel to Western, both are orthogonal to Wilshire. Um, this is Wilshire and Western, and this is a region, and this is a low density area that they're not even trying to upzone to the point that the plan for the under construction Wilshire subway extension, I think the next stop past Western is Highland, maybe? So they're planning on having, I think, a two mile section. This, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's Highland, not Labria. Yeah, so 2.7 kilometers. This, is, this would be two miles. Underground, not underwater, without any natural barrier, without any stops. So Crenshaw, um, so, so what Crenshaw does is Crenshaw is kind of the next main street west of Vermont and Western. So it goes like this. And then to the north, what's the, where are the buses going to serve? This area, like bus ridership here is zero. Um, so yeah, that one diverts, but the rest don't. The rest, you kind of see they stay north-south. They continue, across, even, even the, um, but like all of them, they continue through Wiltshire as if the subway's already there. Um, which is kind of weird because I mean, the, the, bus, the, the bus system kind of pretends that there's already a subway here. I mean, remember, now it is, there's the expo line, but this is clearly an older map from before the expo line, at which point the farthest west urban rail was here, and the buses ignored it. Metro system maps, bus and rail system, detail, and I really hope that this is going to be, that this is going to work. Oh, these are then, okay, A is, the, is blue, B is red, so I guess blue, red, green. I guess they should uh, um, expo and then the stakes half of gold, the stakes half of gold. Okay, that's all. So silly. Wait, what's the K one? Oh, that's, that's the crunch. Oh, yeah. Okay, now I want to see what the route is that I don't remember. X1 Crenshaw. Yeah, this is the Crenshaw letter, I think. Yeah, so, yeah, this is the current map where, yeah, Crenshaw, um, where the line, where, where, where it's more coherent how the buses continue north, south, and, not, and don't try to divert to hit the purple line. But remember, this did not exist and the buses already were not diverting. So in LA, the bus system is much less about connecting to the subway. For example, because LA has one and a half subway lines rather than um, many subway lines, like a city of this size needs probably about 15 or 20 counting commuter lines of which LA has two and a half, none of which is run with any kind of useful frequency. So yeah. Um, the um, so so the upshot is that the buses in LA kind of assume we've already built a rail network. So on in the basin, just build the subway, and I say just build the subway as if I'm saying something very controversial, as if uh, yeah, as if it's not already being done, it's not being done very well. The construction costs are insane, but it's being done. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, it's only being done as far as. Um, I'm forgetting whether it's going only as far as UCLA or also the VA hospital. They should also take it all the way to the sea. But different discussion. Then there's the issue of the valley. And I think the valley is where the commuter rail interface gets more interesting because, for example, there's no commuter rail here. And I don't mean there are lines that they don't run. There are no lines. Um, 
this area never had Camino Real. LA is a new city. LA is not. LA was not a big city back when a lot of um, rail branches were being built, and as a result, it has not many commuter lines. It's something that you can also see in, um, to, to an extent, in Dallas and Houston, for example, Atlanta has a much, or, or Miami, especially just because Miami. Miami didn't really exist as a city in 1900. Not as in it existed, but was small like LA or Houston. It just didn't really exist. I think it had like, I think it had like 2,000 people or something. Um, so the upshot is that... Um, why is this connecting? And so the upshot is that um, where there are commuter trains in the way, that's where it's interesting to look at the interface. And there, I mean, you can just look at where the main buses are. So the most important corridor is Venice. There are a bunch of others, namely, um, so there's Venice, there's Sepulveda. Uh, I think the next two most important are Bobo and, um, and Rosella. And this means that you need to make sure that the commuter trains, forget for a moment that the commuter trains need to be useful as urban rail. Part of that means interfacing with the buses, and it means um, connecting to these stops. So this means that there's a Venice stop, which is here. This should be at the intersection. Um, on the Antelope Valley line, there should be a stop at the intersection with Venice. And they're current, and I, and I don't think there is right now. You can check. Um, but I, but I don't think that's where the stop is. Um, and like was the Van Nuys stop uh, um, on the Ventura County line is not quite a dangerous. Um, oh, it is. Okay, so this map was kind of lying to me. But okay, so this is maybe so maybe this is a good, a better location. But um, then you follow Van Nuys, and here like Selmar's here. It's at Hubbard. Um, so what you want is to have a fuck ton of infill stops, um, so that they connect to all the major buses. So Van Nuys here, here you want to keep doing that with Sepulveda, Balboa, and, um, and Reseda. Um, if there's, so this is kind of back and also to, to the point that you might want to think about some kind of east-west connection. I don't necessarily think that's the best but think about it at least and um yeah so um oh yeah here it also is shown as co-located the train station and the uh and the bus i don't know why that happened it wasn't but yeah silmar san fernando that's the Suppose that a bus needs to divert to hit that. Don't just stop here. Don't make people ride buses longer than necessary. Stop here. Same thing. Um. I don't know what the main east-west routes are, so I'm not sure where you would want to be stopping at. Uh, where you would want to be stopping on the um commuter trains on the Antelope Valley line, but um, but same thing. Like you want you want to actually hit the buses. The, so, so you keep saying that um, better commuter rail operations permit you to move the buses to be more coherent while also connecting to the trains. And the, the flip side is also infill stations permit you to do the same. Um, so, so that's the example I'm talking about with LA and Toronto. Um, so anyway, that's, a, that's my spiel about interface. This is all in central cities. It's very different from what you do when you're in a less frequent, when, when you're in a low frequency regime, like 15 or 20 or 30 minutes, and then you want um, time connections. These are lines that should be running every 10 minutes at worst. And yeah, I'm including lines in LA. But the, the idea in LA that um, it's okay for the subway to run every 12 minutes off peak on a branch is kind of insane. Um, like, the, like these lines, when I, visited which was 10 years ago it turned out that they were running every 12 minutes of peak 10 peak each of them which is ridiculous and so but, but on commuter trains yeah there's this idea that oh you can start incrementally running it every half hour no this is la it's a big city every 10 minutes 
on each of these branches. So the inner line will be fine. Um, like this, like here every turn is kind of ridiculous because it's much closer in, but here think in terms of every turn, here think in terms of every, I don't know, eight, six. Um, yeah, so that's my main spiel about how to connect commuter rail with buses better um, in, a, in, a, in a city. As I said, it's a very North American issue and not very much a European one, mostly because in Europe, commuter trains are already being run well for urban standards, so the buses already are aware that the commuter trains exist and they will try to serve them. Um, but um, but in the United States, even when they're trying to do some commuter rail modernization, they don't really think in terms of how to make it work with the buses, unfortunately. Um, or mostly just don't do commuter rail modernization in the United States. Um, so anyway, just before we t um, it turns into another half hour diversion about mega regions, or do people have questions? This is some massive lag. It's going to at least wait a minute for people to uh, to see this and then type before I quit. Yeah, anyway, so thank you all for watching um, and for bearing with me during the long day version about Imperial trade and you know. will I do the family ticket lecture next week? I might. Um, no promises, but I will, but I will try, okay? Awesome. Yeah, so thank you for participating, and I will see you once again, you know, set in the next week-ish, like either Tuesday or Saturday. So thank you, and um, ciao, ciao.